Thank you, Linda, for the introduction. And I'm really happy to be here <laughs> back at the Institute. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, OPM research that I was a part of when I was at the Institute and also continued working with um, during my time at the University of Windsor. So before we start, I would like to acknowledge the team members, particularly Ben Amick, who was the principal investigator, and Linda Robson, co-principal investigator of this um, phase of the OPM study. We call it OPM3, as well as Sabrina Tonima, um, who was um, a part of the project team. Um, she, had a, she was very valuable. She had educational background in occupational health and safety and uh, worked as a junior OHS professional, so definitely very valuable. And we also would like to thank to Ontario Health, Health and Safety Associations for their support in completing this work, and especially to our workplace recruiters who helped us recruit firms, as well as helped us with data collection, IHSA, WSPS, OCAL, and PSHSA. Um, many occupational health and safety practitioners and researchers have been looking to identify leading indicators of um, workplace injury and illnesses and occupational health and safety. Um, so research has uh, shown us that there are certain work workplace characteristics um, that affect occupational health and safety outcomes and if change could change these outcomes such as safety climate, organizational policies and practices, um, safety practices and observable workplace conditions. In 2008, Chief Prevention Officer established a task force to define a single leading indicator. And in collaboration with IWH, sector-based health and safety associations um, developed a, an eight-item, easy-to-use uh, measure um, to assess an organization's health and safety performance, which we call organizational performance metric. So you can see this is the eight item organizational performance metric. So it covers a variety of organizational concepts that some are um, e very visible such as safety audits and some not such as the relationship between, um, sorry, the, the relative importance of health and safety um, in relation to organizational productivity and efficiency. So this eight item measure, um, basically the organizational respondents, which is usually the key informant who is most knowledgeable about occupational health and safety in an organization, is asked to um, indicate a percentage of time these practices are going inside the organization um, from 0% to 100% of the time. So it's a, um, from one representing 0 to 20% of the time, and five representing 80 to 100 percent of the time. So the higher an organization's OPM score, um, the stronger the OHS uh, performance is. So this, they, they have stronger practices around occupational health and safety. In 2013, Ministry of Labor developed our province's first integrated health and safety strategy and mentioned OPM as an important step in developing an effective leading indicator measurement tool. And OPM, well, the, uh, OPM could also help employers in the province to benchmark um, their occupational health and safety performance to other employers. And also it can help occupational health and safety pro uh, professionals to diagnose the firms in, their, in need of support and also uh, for optimized products and services. So I'm going to give you a little history of the OPM research uh, very quickly. So since its development in um, 2008, IWH in partnership with health and safety associations have been um, researching the measurement properties of OPM as well as its relationship between um, injury and illness rates in organizations. So the first phase after the development of OPM tool in 2009, IWH with um, health and safety associations contacted over 600 workplaces in Ontario. And um, the findings revealed that occupational OPM measures, or OPM scores of an organization, were linked to uh, worker um, compensation, compensation rates. So the higher an organization's OPM score, 
the less likely, um, the, the less that they, the less um, they had, um, sorry, the less injury rates that they had. And first of all, I also would like to say that um, shortness of breath is a very common thing in pregnancy. <laughs> To, well, I was talking to Linda and I said, this happens to me all the time now. <laughs> and I feel like it, 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 all, it either looks like I'm dying or it looks like I'm very nervous. <laughs> so um, I want to apologize for that. So if I need to catch my breath. Um, <laughs> so um, OPM basically predicted um, the previous um, injury rates of an organization. In 2012, um, Health and Safety Associations recontacted um, organizations who were a part of Phase 1, and there were 325 organizations contact, um, contacted, and uh, large OPM scores predicted lower claim rates for these organizations. Um, actually, we found that it, OPM predicted future claim rates. What, uh, what they did is they basically looked at um, claim rates from 2009 to 2012. And um, organizations who had higher scores in 2009 had um, significantly less um, lost time and no lost time um, injury rates compared to organizations with low OPM scores. And further testing of these aspects um, of reliability and validity of OPM has been um, conducted with other samples. In 2013, um, IWH researchers co conducted um, cognitive interviews with um, 20 OHS professionals in organizations. Um, and the aim of the interviews was to understand if those who completed the questionnaires interpreted the questions in the same way or um, and in the way that the quest questions were meant to uh, be interpreted. So we wanted to understand how well the respondents understood and generate answers to these self-reported questions. And the fourth phase, which I'm going to be focusing on today, uh, we looked at uh, two case studies. We established, we wanted to understand um, the answer to these two questions. So the first question was, does the OPM have acceptable construct validity? Simply put, is it measuring what it's supposed to measure? Whether the high OPM scores really correspond to high OHS performance? And the second question, how do observed characteristics of firms were relevant to OHS performance differ in relation to OPM scores? So we wanted to understand whether OPM 8 uh, was a proxy for broader, uh, broader workplace characteristics that are relevant to occupational health and safety performance. So our, our sample uh, was the firms who um, participated in an earlier phase of the OPM, um, series of OPM studies. And um, our initial recruitment strategy was to recruit four matching pairs of firms, um, high versus low um, scores, that are um, matching in organizational sector and size. During recruitment, uh, there were a low number of low OPM firms in the sectors that we identified. So that represented a challenge for our recruitment strategy. So what we did is we decided to look for um, OPM scores, firms with OPM scores that are medium or are not high. And out of 27 firms contacted by HSA um, partners and researchers, we recruited five firms. Um, three of them had OPM score of 39 and 229. Um, and again, reminding you, the 40 is the highest OPM score um, that can be obtained from four different sectors, community services, transportation, manufacturing, agriculture. So in terms of data collection, so this is what we did. Um, two researchers um, conducted worksite visits over a two-day period in five organizations. So during our two-day visit, we conducted interviews with participants from five um, different workplaces, in total 34 people. And, and I'm going to be talking uh, more about the interview process in the following slides. We also did workplace observations. Um, so the, our key informant in the workplace took us through a site tour where we were able to observe 
um, OHS related characteristics of the workplace such as signage um, and or non-OHS related such as the work pace and the interactions on the work site. We also had a chance to review the documents that organizations shared with us, such as Joint Health and Safety Committee minutes and policies and procedures. In addition to um, in researchers' work, uh, we had um, occupational health and safety consultants from HSAs um, paid a one-day visit approximately a month after our visit to these workplaces. And our, actually, the HSA consultants were blinded to the OPM scores, and they conducted a a standardized OHS assessment tool, like a, a short audit or a gap analysis in these organizations. And they shared their report with us and, and the workplaces as well. Um, in order to um, guide our interview guide and um, our data analysis, uh, we worked in a conceptual framework. And we reviewed the OHS literature uh, to find out the characteristics or concepts that are critical to OHS performance. <clears throat> so we um, looked at occupational health, OHS leadership. We basically looked at uh, whether um, an executive leadership or leadership in the organization is supportive and committed to OHS. Um, OHS culture and climate, and of course culture and climate are really broad concepts and always uh, matter for debate, but we wanted to loosely bundle the concepts that are related to beliefs and values of the workers in the organization about health and safety as well as workplace practices that are related to um, whether the OHS is a priority in the organization as well as whether organization has practices such as rewarding and recognizing safety practices. Um, also, we, wanted, we looked at worker participation in OHS, whether the organizations are encouraging workers to participate in decision making or reporting concerns and joint health and safety committee activities and whether um, workers feel safe about um, reporting concerns without the fear of repercussions. And uh, we looked at OHS policies and proce processes such as safety communication, organizational learning, uh, whether the organizations learn from their mistakes and rectify errors, and risk control practices such as responsiveness of the management to worker concerns and how quickly those concerns were, were addressed, um, risk control practices, hazard identification, and of course, OHS training. When we look at our interview process, so as I mentioned, we paid two-day visits to each workplace, and in total, we, we interviewed 34 participants. We, all of the interviews took place in the, um, at the work site in a private room and lasted about an um, average an hour. And at the beginning of each interview, we administered um, OPM questionnaires. So we asked the interview participants to um, fill out the que uh, OPM questionnaire before we started the interviews. So as you can see, we um, interviewed participants from different occupational roles in the organizations, such as senior, senior management with operational um, responsibilities, senior management with OHS responsibilities, um, joint health and safety committee members, uh, worker co-chair and management co-chair, and supervisors and frontline workers. Okay, moving on to our data analysis. So the first research question that we had was, does the OPM have acceptable construct validity? For the purposes of our research, we defined construct validity as a consistent pattern of relationships uh, with higher OPM scores generally corresponding to higher observer-defined OHS performance. So we basically wanted to see whether there, whether uh, organizations with higher o OPM scores really had the best practices based on the data that we collected. And research question two asked, um, how do those o the observed characteristics of firm, firms relevant to OHS performance differ in relation to OPM scores? So in order to um, analyze our data, we use single and cross-case analysis, which I'll be mentioning in the following slides. So let's look at first firm OPM scores. So it looks like a busy table, but I will walk you through it. So the first row that you see is the firm OPM score by our key contact. 
that was that we collected from the previous study. So we basically used these OPM scores um, during our initial recruitment. So as I mentioned, we had three firms with a high OPM score from A, from B, and from E. And we had two firms with a not high, as we call our medium score, from C and from D. But during our site visit, when we re-administered the OPM um, 8 um, with participants on site, we, we were able to validate the um, key informants um, scores with the previous study for the first four firms. So they were very similar to each other, firm A, firm B, firm C, and firm D. And also when we look at the firm average or when we look at the manager and supervisor and worker average, all of these first four firms, um, the, re the results were very similar. The scores were very similar. However, for firm E, things were a little different. So first of all, we found out that when we re-administered the survey with our key informant, there was a big difference between the two scores. So from 39, it was down to 29. And we were really curious about this. So when we look at the different averages, um, the firm average was significantly also lower than the, the first score. And also what we found out in this organization, as you can see for the first four organizations, the person who, had, who, were, who was most informed about OHS was our key contact. But during our site visit, we found out that for, for the last firm, the person who was most informed about OHS was not actually our key contact, but it was a manager with the day-to-day -day responsibilities for OHS. And I'll tell you a little bit about this whole um, situation. So, and also, our findings corresponded with OHS assessment tools by, by health and safety associations. So the high firms um, had really high um, scores. And as you can see, firm A um, did not perform that well on the um, HSA tool. So what we ended up doing is we decided to categorize our five firms as high versus not high. And we wanted to understand through our qualitative analysis what's going on in these organizations. So before moving forward, um, as I mentioned, I, was, I wanted to talk a little bit about our data analysis process. So we started with single case analysis. After we coded all of the information from all of the interviews, um, we summarized and extracted our data um, from each case. And then what we did is we mapped, and, and this is just to give you an example um, of how the process worked. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about all these um, characteristics in, in the further slides. But what we did is, um, this is just a little sample for two concepts. So for each concept, we created a case-by-concept data display matrix where we put our little summaries of our um, each firm so that we were able to visually compare on, and contrast what was going on in the organizations and the characteristics for each concept. So for example, you can see for organizational learning and for safety communication. After we did this, um, we then moved on to ranking these firms. Um, so that's what we did. So we started looking at um, which, of, which organization had the best performance, which we indicated by five, and which had the poorest performance we indicated by one. So we basically qualitatively ranked the quality of the OHS practices in organizations. Five meaning the best performance, and one meaning the poor performance. So in some cases, for example, two firms had a tie. We were able to give them the same um, ranking, 4.5 and 4.5. So we did this for all of the concepts in our conceptual framework, and we came up with this one big table. So these were our conceptual categories that I mentioned. And when we looked at all of the rankings, we find out that firm A and firm B, who had the highest OPM scores, um, significantly ranked higher um, compared to other um, organizations. And then when we look at firm E, um, it's, it, it's significant, it was significantly ranked the lowest for um, the concepts. And firm C and D were basically in the middle. So what we find out is when we looked at our qualitative data, we said that, well, we actually come up with three categories again. 
high, medium, and low. So, and it coincided with um, the OPM scores of the contact most informed about occupational health and safety. So for A and for B, we're high, C and D were in the middle, we can say, and firm E had, a, had the lowest score. So it was very similar to what we found in terms of our um, ranking, qualitative ranking of the um, firms. So I'm going to now talk a little bit about, um, perhaps to answer the second question. So what are the differences between these organizations in relation to their OP, uh, occupational uh, OHS performance? So, of course, there, there we have found certain vari uh, variation um, within each category. So, for example, some um, two of the high firms could vary in terms of how they manage um, some of their policies and processes. But this table gives you an understanding of the overall um, picture in, in these firms about um, their OHS performance. So, high OPM firms. Um, when we talked about talk to the participants about the executive leadership and their um, commitment and support to health and safety, it was very clear that executive leadership really made a stance about occupational health organize, uh, OHS, and they were really supportive in terms of um, consulting to the HSA manager, for example, or um, showing their support um, visibly by um, providing video um, videos about how important health and safety for the organization so that workers could see that executive leadership was um, conveying this message. And also, when we look at the health and safety and supervisory leadership, it was really hands-on. Um, health and safety managers were really involved in the day-to-day -day, um, operations and day-to-day -day health and safety, and they were very visible in the organization. And also, um, the commitment of leadership um, also showed that um, health and safety was a priority in these organizations. And we could hear it from uh, participants' narratives that they talked about the company models or um, the, 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 the commonalities that they shared in terms of how important health and safety and um, workers felt like they could refuse, the, refuse work if they felt unsafe. Um, and at the same time, um, organizations provided consistent recognition for safe practices, either monetary or, or verbal. So workers felt like their safe practices was, were recognized. Uh, worker participation was encouraged. These organizations had um, processes in place, such as uh, report cards, incident reports, uh, for workers to use on a day-to-day -day basis to report their concerns. Uh, but at the same time, for example, in one high-performance organization, um, workers were also involved in decision-making about health and safety. And also, the communication was more frequent and, and two-way. So um, there were informal and formal channels used, um, formal channels being health and safety bulletin boards and informal. People could just go and talk to managers whenever they need to if they had a concern. And um, also, I think one of the most um, um, interesting things about these two organizations is um, they had formal audits in place compared to other organizations. So they had yearly formal audits that they used the information that they get from these audits to um, improve their processes, improve their practices. Um, they had their, the use of personal protective equipment was highly encouraged. Actually, if people did not use it, they could get reprimanded for that as well. Um, and they had very comprehensive occupational health and safety practices. Sorry. Um, so just to show in their own words, so participants from high OPM firms um, said that executive leadership eats and breeds safety. Safety is our top priority. If you don't feel safe, don't do it. So we heard this over and over again from participants. And also um, HSA managers said that they were really interested in investigating and learning from um, errors and taking corrective actions. When we look at the medium OPM firms, we found that their practices varied um, uh, based on the department and management. And I'll explain it. Um, I'll explain it. So one thing that we found out is in these organizations, executive leadership was not really visible. So they really um, gave all the responsibility to HS management. But at times, HS managers did not feel supported by the executive management because their primary focus was the business. Um, 
However, HS leadership was really hands-on, personally invested, and also in these organizations, health and safety was a part of um, HR manager's responsibility. And at times, um, this, um, the, the, the conflict and demands uh, for their time and effort that they could use for health and safety um, gave them significant challenge in managing health and safety. And also, the priority of OHS really depended on the department. So we could not find that there wasn't a, a very unified understanding of um, priority of safety in these organizations. So for example, for some departments, if the manager or the supervisor really believes in safety, so um, that, that those departments were different than other departments where the manager did not uh, believe in safety or did not pay too much attention to um, safety practices. So that led to our understanding of there wasn't a unified safety culture. It really depended on the different locations um, of the organization. And when we look at the communication, it was more top-down and formal and one-way. So workers were encouraged to um, report concerns, and they felt comfortable reporting concerns. But the, however, they felt like they were not um, participating um, in the decision-making. Um, and again, compared to high OPM firms, they did not have, two uh, medium OPM firms did not have formal audits, although they had joint health and safety committee um, inspections in place. Um, they did have HS policy and processes documented. But we found out that the learning, especially or, or, uh, ongoing learning, was not encouraged, so it was more compliance focused. And again, responsiveness depended on the management. Um, workers' concerns sometimes were not looked after until an incident or an accident occurred. Um, and OHS training was well, less comprehensive than the um, high firms. So as you can see, um, management sometimes did not feel supported by the executive leadership, or the communication sometimes were um, communicated as um, top down, it follows downhill, and um, at the same time, although personal power, uh, protective equipment was provided to all of the workers, it was not, it, their use were not strictly encouraged. So we heard that in some locations, for example, of these organizations, people either choose or not to choose to wear them. <clears throat> When we look at the low OPM firm that we have, um, we found that, again, executive leadership was not visible, and they were really interested in the business side of things. But what was interesting about this organization, when we talked about the occupation uh, OHS priority, whether health and safety is a priority in the organization, we got a really clear message that it was the business and the productivity that was most important, and then health and safety. So uh, there wasn't a recognition for health and, um, for um, safety practices. Uh, however, there were some prizes and rewards for um, worker ideas about efficiency, which might have included safety. But we learned that there was an, um, a specific recognition for safety. And also, um, in terms of this organization's culture, um, it was unique in a sense that uh, we heard from uh, workers and management that um, in terms of the culture, it was more... Um, the emphasis, emphasis was on personal responsibility. So basically, um, workers were considered either error prone or safe. And it was the worker's responsibility to engage in safe, safe behavior or safe practices. And um, so for example, we heard that if somebody does not feel safe, then the organization could find someone um, who, who does it more safer. So that created um, a more of a personal responsibility culture and reactive culture. And um, communication was more top to down and workers were communicated about safety on a need to know basis. And although there, ha there was a joint health and safety committee, however, it wasn't very visible and uh, we could not find much of documentation around joint health and safety committee activities. And um, we learned that um, organization does not seek um, learning actively. However, um, they had some help in the past um, from um, outside um, in terms of um, learning more about health and safety practices. And while well, one of the other things that we found is, although, again, there were personal protective equipment available to um, workers, 
their use was not encouraged and sometimes actually PPEs were not used by supervisors because they were um, limiting the efficiency of um, the production or processes. Um, so as you can see, as I mentioned, safety was not their top priority um, and also in terms of improving health and safety ideas, um, really the organization did not pursue learning um, due to um, limitations of economics. Um, and also, as I mentioned, um, injuries were seen as the worker's fault. <clears throat> so what we found is um, high OPM firms showed characteristics consistent with strong OHS performance. So they had a strong positive um, o uh, safety culture, executive leadership was invested in safety, good communication, ongoing learning, <coughs> and risk control practices. <coughs> and they really focused on building proactive OHS systems. When we looked at the medium and low OPM firms, we found that they had more varied and weaker OHS um, characteristics. So for example, as I mentioned in the medium organizations, really the importance of safety could depend on the department. One location had uh, more of a safety focus, but it depended on the other, uh, on, on the managers themselves. Um, and they did not have much of a unified safety culture. So there was more variability in terms of how OHS has been implemented. Thus we concluded that we had a, we could say that OPM had good construct validity because the pattern characteristics um, of characteristics that we found really match the um, predicted for high versus low. So although OPM8 is really short in, um, it's a very remarkably short um, scale, but I think, but it was comprehensive in nature in terms of um, finding out that the scores really um, corresponded with um, strong or, or weaker OHS characteristics. In terms of the application, <clears throat> so high OPM firms, as I mentioned, has strong OHS practices and they focus on building proactive OHS practices. So the question could be then about high OPM firms is, how can we sustain the OPM performance that they, they have? Because they really focus on establishing these um, sustainable cultures. For medium and low, um, the focus could be on how can OHS improvement be, um, OHS performance be improved? So for example, one idea would be to work with leadership or board of directors to strengthen commitment to OHS because we found that the top management um, really did not invest in safety and was not, were not visible. Also, as I mentioned, the variation between departments, it could be possible to identify a department or location where there's a stronger OHS culture or OHS practices and diffuse those practices to the overall organization. <clears throat> of course, our study has limitations, as I mentioned. Um, we had challenges during our recruitment process. So we had a limited sample size of five firms, um, as opposed to we wanted to look at high versus low firms of four matched pairs. And, uh, and we also interviewed um, six to seven per people from each worksite. And we were only visiting the worksites for two, two days. So we were looking at a, a broad range of concepts. And of course, it was, um, it's impossible to be able to have a, a very clear and robust understanding of an organization uh, in such a limited time. And um, yeah, we, I talked about the matching firms, so we had a limited number of firms to approach. So looking forward, we completed our study and uh, we have a manuscript in, pre in preparation, so we're hoping to submit it to safety science. And also, as a follow-up study, as a continuation of the series of OPM studies, um, Dynamic is the PE principal investigator of this new research um, that was granted by, um, funded by the Ministry of Labor, where uh, we're looking at how leaders actually use benchmarking information, um, uh, including OPM, to make decisions in the workplace and how do they make decisions when they actually have this kind of information in terms of their firm scores and what they can do with these scores in terms of changing things in the organization. Um, well, thank you very much all. 
I really enjoy presenting, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to answer.